I'm delighted to welcome Professor Miranda Fricker from uh, Graduate Center at City University of New York. Uh, Miranda's hugely influential book from 2007, Epistemic Injustice, uh, talks about the ways in which people can be unjustly deprived of or perceived as lacking knowledge, as, for example, when someone's testimony is assumed to be unreliable because of their race or gender or social status. Um, just to say a little bit about the Dorothy Emmett lectures, this is, I think, our fifth annual Dorothy Emmett lecture. Uh, it comm commemorates, unsurprisingly, Dorothy Emmett, uh, who was an eminent mid 20th century philosopher um, and was head of the philosophy department at Manchester for over 20 years. I'm um, speaking as someone who's been a head of department before. And I'm sure Graham, our current head of department, who is here someone, uh, somewhere will back me up. Um, that seems completely unfeasible. I don't know how she did that. Anyway, um, so Miranda uh, is currently finishing a book uh, called Blaming and Forgiving the, the Work of Morality. Um, and forgiveness is the topic of this lecture, which is called How is Forgiveness a Gift? So, Miranda, over to you. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. It's a, a great honor to be here to be doing this lecture. And thanks so much for the invitation, Helen. And, and thank you all for coming. So I will share my screen, I hope, now. Now, is that looking, I hope that's looking to everyone like the first slide of a PowerPoint. So my title is, How is Forgiveness a Gift? And as Helen said, this is sort of one chapter in the book that I'm finishing up. And it's um, a particular sort of puzzle I want to introduce that concerns the normativity of forgiveness, that on the one hand, we feel that under certain circumstances, there can be some kind of rational obligation to forgive. And yet on the other hand, many people feel very strongly that there remains something elective or gift-like about forgiving. And these two ideas are intention. And the purpose of my talk is to offer a solution to that apparent tension. And just to get it going, um, I'm not going to be very concerned with the distinction between these two kinds of forgiveness, but I just want to introduce and put on the table the terms conditional forgiveness and unconditional forgiveness. In the broad, I think um, both in philosophy and in real life, we have at least two rather different, in fact, startlingly condition, different uh, conceptions of forgiveness and different practices of forgiveness. One that we often call conditional um, is you wrong me, I might, I may or may not blame you. If you apologize, or I would like to say, maybe it need not strictly take the form of apology, but if you express appropriate remorse in various possible ways, I'm just gonna call that apology for short, then and only then do I have a proper reason to forgive you. And it's both the normative condition of appropriate forgiveness on this conception, and we might add the psychological trigger. And very often if somebody's wronged you, it's the fact that they've apologized that makes you feel able to overcome whatever feelings of hurt or resentment you may be feeling. So that's one type of forgiveness that's out there. And for some philosophers, that's a model of all forgiveness, but uh, there aren't many philosophers who insist that that's really the only sort of practice that's appropriately called forgiveness. For the most part, most people writing in this area think of there as existing another kind of practice of forgiveness that we might call unconditional forgiveness. Some people call it elective forgiveness or one-sided forgiveness. And that, as you might be surprised to hear, is the kind of forgiveness where you wrong me, um, I may or may not express blame to you, but at some point I overcome those feelings anyway, even though you have not apologized, not expressed remorse, and I move to forgive you anyway, as it were, upfront, preemptively, regardless of your responses. And many of us think of that as a kind of special moral magnanimity, a special kind of generosity that's associated with that kind of forgiveness. On the other hand, by the same token, those who, there are those who are suspicious of it as letting people off that really we shouldn't be going in for unconditional forgiveness because it's really more than anything a failure to hold people responsible. So there are, there are different views about uh, these different practices and how to use the word forgiveness, but let's just assume two broad kinds of forgiveness out there that we go in for conditional and unconditional. Now, 
I want to explore what I'm just loosely calling here the electivity intuition. The intuition is that you know, obviously we can see that those who are happy with the practice of uh, unconditional forgiveness, obviously there, the unconditionality presents forgiveness precisely as something that I, the hurt party, can elect to do as and when I want, regardless of whether there's been apology. And sometimes this is talked about as an act of grace, as Glenn Pettigrove does, or that there's something gift-like at the base of forgiveness, as Lucy L.A. does. And there's no problem with the idea that uh, there's something elective, gift-like, when forgiveness takes this unconditional form. Lucy L.A., who's written so interestingly about forgiveness and defending unconditional forgiveness as a rational and appropriate moral response in some circumstances, however, makes a stronger point. And she, here and there in her work, has argued that actually in both kinds of forgiveness, not only unconditional, but also conditional forgiveness, there remains something elective or gift-like at base. So, for instance, here's a little quotation from her that expresses this thought. Forgiveness is elective in the sense that it can be given without repentance on the part of the wrongdoer. Okay, so that's elective forgiveness, unconditional forgiveness. But then she goes on. And repentance need not oblige the victim to forgive. Another way of putting this point is that forgiveness is often thought of as a gift. And in fact, elsewhere, she's put it a little stronger, saying all kinds of forgiveness seem to have something gift-like or elective at base. So even when the wrongdoer has expressed repentance, as she puts it, or as I might prefer to put it, even when you've received an apology, an appropriate expression of remorse, you're not obliged. That's her word. In fact, she says that repentance need not oblige. And I think she's using a very careful form of words there because of course there could be certain circumstances where the other aspects of the situation might create a rational obligation or a moral obligation to forgive. But the fact of repentance itself need not do so. Now, I guess we're in the territory of thinking about this basic gift-like or electivity aspect of forgiveness. Uh, in relation to a kind of moral distaste, I think that we quite rightly have, and it gets expressed in different ways, a moral distaste for the idea that a forgiver, someone who's been morally wounded after all, might be brought under any kind of pressure to forgive. And that's a large part of what I think is going on in the intuition that there's something elective or gift-like. So we shouldn't place people under pressure or feel under pressure to forgive others. Now, a first kind of pressure to consider is what I'm calling here external pressures to forgive. So in particular, pressures from third parties. And I want to give a little bit of airtime to this in order to respect it and set it aside. I think it's quite true that in almost all cases where someone might forgive another, it's inappropriate or at best very risky to do anything that could place pressure as a third party on that person to bring them to forgive. So Maisha Cherry, uh, fairly recently in 2017, in a paper called Forgiveness Exemplars and the Oppressed, makes this point from the point of view of societies where there are minorities and majorities or oppressors and oppressed. And she says, in particular, in relation to an ethics of exemplars, where the thought is, a third party might be saying, hey, you should you know, think of a, an exemplar of forgiveness like Martin Luther King. You should be more like Martin Luther King and forgive those who wrong you. And she's very concerned that this is normally uh, a kind of mistaken line of argument in various ways she, that she explains, but in particular puts undue pressure on the potential mm -hmm. forgiver. So she says, I reject the appeal to exemplars of forgiveness on the part of those in positions of power in order to persuade those with less or members of minorities that can be muscled by majorities to forgive. And so it's a rather specific version of the idea that external pressures should not be placed on would-be forgivers, uh, and one that invokes in particular the kind of inappropriateness that is derived from inequalities of power. But worries about the wrongfulness of external pressures can be made from slightly different points of view, though still in terms of power. Pamela Sue Anderson, for instance, wrote in a lovely paper about uh, forgiveness in a Christian context, Pamela Sue Anderson writing as a Christian 
feminist herself, and in particular in relation to concerns about potential obligations to forgive in the Christian community when it comes to sexual misconduct or sexual assault. And she said this, justice comes apart from forgiveness in socially and materially problematic ways due to our sexually specific locatedness within religious and other cultural traditions. I have in mind traditions and not mere stereotypes, which have been deeply shaped by a denigration of women as the result of a projection of sinful behavior onto mothers, wives, partners, mistresses, lovers, and so on. So there, I take it a kind of shorthand, though no doubt a cartoon version of what she intended, a shorthand concern, and this, this might be extended to Cherry's point too, is that where you have any kind of climate where it's presumed that there's an obligation of any kind to forgive others who wrong you, let alone if you might that might give way to a kind of accepted practice of remonstrating with those who are wrong to try and encourage them or persuade them to forgive, whether in relation to an exemplar or in relation to the set of values that the, the community in question has in Anderson's case as a Christian. There is a deep risk that what really goes on, especially if there are inequalities of power, is that those who are hurt and are typically likely to continue to be hurt and wronged are encouraged, even pressurized to forgive, and that just perpetuates the practice. So these are two sorts of kindred worries about external pressures to forgive. They're not going to be my focus today. I want to focus on a puzzle that arises due to internal pressures within the normativity of forgiveness. So within what it is to have a reason to forgive and indeed a sufficient reason to forgive on the conditional model of forgiveness. Because remember that Alay's challenge, if you like, was that there was something gift-like or elective at the heart even of conditional forgiveness. So let's look at the convincing model of conditional forgiveness and see whether we might be able to fit in electivity to it in some way that resolves the tension between rational requirement and uh, electivity. So a person who's writing in a particular paper, a paper entitled Articulating an Uncompromising Forgiveness uh, by, by Pamela Hieronymi, something I I, every time I, it's one of those papers, every time I go back to it, I find some new nuance in it. Um, but a model of conditional forgiveness uh, that she presents there is, I think, uh, very persuasive and it's been enormously influential. So let me start there for us to get a handle on how thinking about the normativity of conditional forgiveness seems to create an internal pressure in the form of a rational requirement to forgive. Her paper focuses quite a lot actually on apology and the question of how come apology seems to be a kind of magic wand that one can wave and it makes forgiveness be due. She makes that as a kind of observation and it's one that I share and many shares and she wants to look in to see how apology, how apology functions to make forgiveness be due or owing or appropriate at the very least. She says that actions, or she, she observes, and I've many, many people would agree with this, actions um, and wrongs in particular carry meanings. They have expressive content. And when I wrong another person, my action might do a number of things. Supposing my wrong is that I've mugged them. Maybe I've injured them in the course of this mugging. Well, there's an injury and there's the loss of the wallet, et cetera. These are obvious harms, but there are more things to be said about the nature of the wrongs. And these can only be understood if we look at the moral meanings expressed in an act of a mugging, for instance. And she says that acts of wrong of this kind or indeed of far lesser kinds too, make a threatening claim. There's a threatening claim, morally threatening claim inherent or expressed in the wrong done. And that threatening claim uh, involves, actually I think is a bit of an ambiguity. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of moral threat there, which is the threat that it's okay for me to mug you, it's okay for me to treat you badly. But it's also a kind of more empirical threat that 
given that I think it's okay for me to treat you badly, I might do it again. So there's a kind of purely symbolic moral threat there that in my treating you badly, I take myself as permitted to treat you as lesser. And then there's also given I do take you as lesser, I might do it again. So there's a kind of dual threatening claim there. A less drastic example than a mugging might be a condescending colleague. So you've got a new job and maybe you go out for drinks afterwards with a few colleagues and you're chatting. And one of the colleagues who you kind of thought was um, treating you decently suddenly comes out with something incredibly condescending in front of your other uh, new colleagues. And you think, oh, OK, so that's how you're going to treat me there act of condescension towards you in front of the other new colleagues is its own harm, but it also carries meanings, these dual meanings of, I take myself to be able to condescend to you, put you down in front of the team, and I might do it again. So that's the, the dual moral threat to any wrong. Now, what Hieronymy argues, and I find it completely plausible, is that the, the magic wand factor in apology consists in the fact that apologies retract precisely those threatening claims. And because they retract those threatening claims, they retract those moral meanings that were inherent or expressed by the act, the apology rationally undermines any continued resentment or blame feelings or resentment fueled treatments. Because after the claim is retracted, there's no, no further thing for the resentments to, as it were, protest. And I think that seems exactly right to me. Um, if we imagine the condescending colleague, as it were, coming up to you later and saying, I'm so sorry, I don't know what came over me. I just, I was just being an idiot. Uh, I really didn't intend to, it to come out that way, but um, I, I really won't do it again. Then they have retracted the meanings that you found inherent in their act of condescension. And so if you trust their apology and you take it as sincere and you take them to be somewhat in control of their behavior in the future, then, as it were, the act can't be undone, but its moral meaning can be retracted. And that's what sincere and appropriate apologies do. Other things equal. A related account of conditional forgiveness, just so that you know that I'm not depending entirely on one paper by Pamela Hieronymi, or, albeit an influential one, but I particularly like her emphasis on the moral meanings of uh, acts, which will uh, come back later. A similar sort of model is from Charles Griswold, who's an enormously influential figure. His 2000, 2007 full length book treatment of forgiveness uh, really helped put forgiveness on the map as a new topic in moral philosophy, which really hadn't been written about very much before that. And now the literature has exploded and everybody seems to be writing about it. He gives a rather uh, elaborate account of what it takes to render forgiveness appropriate and to render it, uh, as it were, to, 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 to generate an obligation to forgive. And he spells out what in Hieronymy we saw broadly called apology in terms of six overlapping conditions that the wrongdoer might need to meet in order to give the maximally most fulsome kind of apology, uh, which can prompt what he calls paradigm, by which he means ideal forgiveness. So there's in his account, there's a sort of super ideal forgiveness and everything goes maximally well and you've been given maximal confidence from the wrongdoer that they're sorry, et cetera, and they won't do it again. And that uh, prompts what he calls paradigm forgiveness. And I would emphasize that he also thinks there can be lots of non-paradigm forgiveness where some disjunction of these six conditions might be met. But very quickly, these overlapping conditions are that the wrongdoer accepts responsibility uh, for what they've done and that they reject their misdeed. They repudiate the misdeed. I actually don't know whether, I, I don't know that seems to me to mean the same thing as rejecting the misdeed. As I said, I think these are overlapping conditions rather than entirely separate ones. Expressing regret, uh, commit to changing. That's very much a, 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 another sort of commitment. Showing understanding of the damage done. That's connected with expressing regret and repudiation, but it might be thought to be somewhat separate. And offering a narrative explanation and I've put both retrospective and prospective. The narrative explanation aspect, I think is really 
uh, worth noting in Griswold's account because it's so important that we situate not only forgiving but also blaming and all of our moral responses of moral address in time. They take time. They are not just, as it were, attitudes that are prompted in a moment. They are processes which it might take a lifetime to forgive in some circumstances, or it might take a nanosecond. It just depends on the nature of the situation. But all of these things are processes. And his notion of narrative explanation. So if I've done a very wrong thing, perhaps I've told a huge and important lie to a close friend of mine, and I express how sorry I am, as it were, one through five. I regret it, I won't do it again. I can't believe what I did. I also need to kind of explain myself. How on earth did I wind up telling you of all people a lie about something important? I need to understand how I wound up doing something so ridiculous and also how I'm going to not get into that kind of a corner again, hence the retrospective and prospective aspects of one's narrative explanation. So the most ideal and fulsome sort of apology uh, contains all these elements and will prompt uh, ideal or paradigm forgiveness in Griswold's account. So these are the conditions uh, at the limit that someone might fulfill. And then it looks for all the world that if one fulfills those conditions, it looks like there's some kind of a rational requirement to forgive. And that's what generates what I'm calling the electivity puzzle, that once we spell out in a fairly standard way, a la Hieronymi or a la Griswold, the fulfillment of conditions for appropriate forgiveness, it looks like we get more than just, as it were, a permission to forgive. It looks like we get a rational requirement and obligation to forgive. And certainly in Hieronymi's own work, she, she uses the phrase rational requirement. And she gives expression to uh, what I'm calling the electivity puzzle by um, elaborating some of the, the sort of tension between the two ideas of electivity and rational requirements. So let me just uh, quickly read this juicy little quotation from her paper. And she's speculating about what, what this elective aspect that some people are worried about might be. She says, the claim that forgiveness must be elective might mean that forgiveness can't be required or demanded by others, that it's supererogatory, not something we owe to another, but rather something we freely give. And in some sense, this must be right. On the other hand, there is certainly a sense in which being unforgiving rightly draws blame, in which we do owe one another forgiveness. Much ink has been spilt over this issue. I won't address the problem here, but will simply suggest why I think it's so difficult. Now, I too think it's difficult and more ink has continued to be spilt since her paper came out and she doesn't purport to treat it. She, she just, as she says, wants to uh, say why it's so difficult and set it to one side, but it creates our agenda for today. I'm not going to set it to one side and that's my project is to try and reconcile the idea of rational requirement to forgive and the idea of there being something elective or gift-like at the base of forgiveness. So to both honor the rational requirement tradition within conditional forgiveness and honor Lucy Allais' uh, uh, thought and indeed widespread intuition that the, there's something gift-like there in both kinds of forgiveness. Now Hieronymy um, says a bit more about what it might be. She says it might be a concern that one should be able to elect not to forgive without thereby incurring blame. That's to say the claim that forgiveness must be elective might mean that forgiveness can't be required or demanded by others. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is a that's a repeat that should have got deleted. Longer version of the quotation. OK, so with that tension set up by uh, Hieronymy, I want to go over what I have in the past found a really tempting idea. And indeed, I have sort of published something uh, putting forward this idea, but I, I no longer think it's right. The tempting idea is that perhaps there can be rational requirements to forgive when someone has fully apologized in an appropriate way and so on. And yet there might be no directed obligation to the wrongdoer, to the apologizer to forgive them. So the thought would be maybe the kind of obnoxious anti-elective idea that generates our, our concern and generates the tension is that there's something bad about, you know, if you've been wronged 
all they have to do is apologize to you and suddenly you owe it to them to forgive them. That seems like too much of a pressure, one might think. It seems to create too much of a strongly dyadic relation between you and the person who's wronged you that now you're kind of almost in their debt just because they've apologized and so now you have to forgive. I found this a very tempting idea for a while and another way of putting it or rather kind of filling out the notion of a directed obligation, which is simply the idea of a bipolar obligation that A owes, has an obligation to B, to Phi, so I have an obligation to my apologizer wrongdoer to forgive them in virtue of the fact that they've apologized. Jay Wallace has uh, filled into that picture in relation to what he calls relational obligations, which actually in his view isn't an alternative name for direct, directed obligations exactly, but is, is the beginnings of a conception of obligations quite generally. But the useful point from his conception is a certain symmetry of reasons, which uh, also might help us see what we might find obnoxious in the directed obligation to your wrongdoer to forgive them. So he says about relational obligations that what's distinctive of them is the very things that give us reasons to do X also give another party a claim against us that we should do X and a privileged basis for objecting if we should fail so to act. So the kind of example he would have in mind would be that if I've promised you to come to your uh, you know, engagement party and uh, I fail to show, then there's a symmetry of reasons, a, sym a symmetry of normativity between us in that the same fact was giving me a reason to show up and gives you a reason to rebuke or resent me if I fail to show up. And the fact in question is the fact that I promised you that I will come. And so, as it were, there's you and me and a shared reason that that delivers and makes appropriate different sorts of responses. In my case, to show up. And in your case, if I fail to uh, rebuke me or resent me for um, failing to show. Now, we might just want to deny that when a wrongdoer apologizes to you, it generates those sorts of symmetrical reasons, because what seems perhaps at least on, uh, on the face of it to be the ethically noxious idea is that just because they've apologized to me, I now owe it to them and they can point to the fact that they apologized as my reason for oughting to forgive them and their reason for now rebuking, rebuking me or resenting me if I fail to forgive them. Now, I thought for a while that that was a pretty plausible uh, explanation for why we had a kind of distaste for the idea of rational obligation. If rational obligations generate those sorts of reasons, relational obligations in Wallace's sense, that looks like the kind of internal and interpersonal pressure that shouldn't be placed on a forgiver. But now I don't think it's true uh, because it seems to me that it's just a fact, it's just a normative fact of life that if I've been wronged and then they apologize appropriately, right? It's gotta be appropriate apology and I, I recognize it as such and other things are equal, right? So there aren't any special circumstances that are sort of undermining the situation, but other things equal, they've wronged me and now they've apologized. Well, I do have a rational obligation uh, to forgive them and relate those sorts of rational obligations are directed and relational if anything is the normative of forgivity, forgiveness is absolutely bipolar absolutely directed I don't owe it for general reasons that I should forgive who oh yeah that's the person I owe it to that individual because of how they treated me and because of how they've now reacted to it. They and they alone are the one who can retract the moral meaning, the moral threat, as Hieronymy puts it, that was expressed in their action. And now that they've done it, I and I alone uh, can forgive them for having treated me in that way. So it really does look like a very bad idea, philosophically speaking, to start trying to deny that the kinds of rational obligations that are generated by apology are neither directed nor relational because they really look like a kind of paradigm central case of directed and relational obligations. Indeed, I think this is um, kind of borne out by a reaction that 
many have if they are forgiven in more impersonal terms. So some people will report if they say they've been forgiven and the person who's, for, you know, is where you long to be forgiven from the, the individual that you've hurt, the particular friend I told that stupid lie to, I want her to forgive me uh, because of how I'm now feeling about it and because of how I'm now retracting it and so on and how I want to patch up my relationship with her. Were she to say, oh, I forgive you because, you know, in general, I think one should always forgive friends or because it's my personal religion to forgive or because I, I'm, I've got no time for beef in my life. I've got a new blanket principle. I always forgive. I might feel, well, better than continuing resentments, but I might feel I haven't really been forgiven. It feels like I've kind of contingently fallen under some impersonal general principle of forgiveness. And people do often report feeling somehow left out of the equation if the forgiveness takes that more impersonal form, which of course it can do, but it's not the normal case. And it's often a rather unsatisfying kind of case. So I think this supports the idea that the rational obligations of forgiveness that are generated by apology are directed and relational. And uh, when we find that difficult to swallow, we, we need to either live with it or ask ourselves whether it's a situation where other things aren't equal. And the reason we don't feel happy to live with it is because of some other aspect that's morally relevant. So a better hypothesis, not the initially tempting one, but another route. How about the thought that it's not the directedness or relationality of the normative relation itself? It's actually the idea somewhat hinted at in Jay Wallace's quotation that the, apolo the wrongdoer apologizer might demand it from you, might demand to be forgiven as of right. And many people have observed this aspect and I want to home in on this as the point at which uh, um, we discover the element of electivity that we should seek to preserve in a conditional account of forgiveness and find a way of making it compatible with the notion of rational obligation or rational requirement that we've been uh, taking as part of that picture. So Griswold says, hitting the nail on the head beautifully as he does in so many places in that book, forgiveness may not be demanded or compelled. Nobody has an enforceable right to forgiveness. Now, actually, he, he gives quite a brief treatment of this and he is thinking in part about third parties. So no, that's why he has the word enforceable in there. We can't enforce the right because no one else can make me forgive you for the lie you've told me. That would be inappropriate. But I think he's also alluding to, it's not just that third parties can't, I also can't really demand it. Now, that's what I want to try and explain. He gives what I think, he says some true things about it, but I don't think they really explain why. He says that it's because forgiveness involves a change of heart and it's got to be honest and sincere. Those are his words. And if it isn't honest and sincere because it's been demanded as of right, then it's going to be at best morally empty, at worst disrespectful of the other party. I, I want to kind of agree with all that, but I don't think we really understand, understand yet why that is the case. If I've wronged you, and you have a, and I've apologized in an appropriate way and other things are equal. You therefore have a rational requirement to forgive me, some kind of moral obligation to forgive me. Why can't I demand it? It seems to me I, I can't demand it. I can ask for it. I can hope for it. I might even on a bad day plead for it, uh, but I can't demand it or require it as of right. And I don't think we understand yet why that is. What goes wrong? when we attempt to make a kind of claim right to be forgiven. Now, I think a clue to get to the bottom of this question is to look at the normativity of gratitude. In a lovely paper on gratitude from the 80s by Claudia Card, she notes, we can owe what others only deserve from us without having any right against us. So she observes about gratitude that gratitude can be owed um, we even talk about having a debt of gratitude, and certainly it's dyadic, bipolar, directed in all these ways, and it's going to be relational too. So if you've shown me a great deal of generosity in the past, uh, and I owe you gratitude as a result, the fact 
that you've shown me so much generosity in the past is the same fact that for me generates my obligation of gratitude towards you and generates for you an entitlement to feel sort of well, maybe even rebuke me if I fail to show gratitude. So not only directed, but relational in Wallace's sense, and yet no right. And think what happens when you try to demand somebody else's gratitude as a matter of right. It's not going to go well. It seems like you, we, we can't demand it as a right. And in this way, I'm just observing so far that it seems to inhabit just the same normative space as forgiveness does. Now, Adrian Martin, in a much more recent paper, uh, drawing partly on card, has made the same uh, observation that we have these directed and relational obligations of gratitude and yet no right to it. And um, this is what I want to uh, explain. So I think the way to go is to take more than usually seriously the metaphor of forgiveness being a gift. It seems to me forgiveness isn't just like a gift. <laughs> And the fact that its normativity seems to inhabit just the same space or display the same structure as the normativity of forgiveness is suggestive of uh, the fact that forgiveness isn't just like a gift. Forgiveness is a gift or is a kind of gift. And that will be a useful clue in how we think about what goes wrong when you try to demand it as of right. And I want to take an entirely pragmatic perspective on acts of forgiveness uh, considered as acts of generosity and in order to see how they go wrong when they are demanded or extracted well there's an attempt to extract it as of as a as of requirement so um, the proposal is that the core explanation why we never have a claim right to be forgiven even when we have all the indebtedness and obligations is that such a claim right would be incoherent because pragmatically self-defeating now, it's just like demanding a gift in that, uh, in that same way. Supposing you want a gift, forget you're my closest friend. I'm going to change the example. Let's make it an actual gift. Supposing I want an anniversary gift from a partner. Uh, notoriously, as, as it were, it'd be a, a kind of source of much comedy that if you demand an anniversary gift or other gifts that are expressions of love or commitment or friendship, it's going to kind of go wrong. The best you're going to end up receiving as you sent them to the store to buy you the bracelet that's going to be the symbol of your relationship and that they're going to give it to you as you tell them how to wrap it up and when to give it to you. It's going to not be the thing that you long for. It's going to wind up not, to use Hieronymus, uh model, it's not going to be uh, an expression of love or an expression of, expression of congratulation or of uh, close friendship whatever it's meant to be, it's going to end up being at best a kind of ersatz empty version of that meaning and maybe end up actually somehow symbolizing the absence of those commitments. There's nothing worse than a kind of gift demanded and emptily received. Its meaning seem to change and the nature of the gift seems to change before your very eyes and deteriorate into some other thing. Now there's various models of pragmatic self-defeat that we might draw on to help us understand exactly what's going on. One model uh, comes from Christine Korsgaard's treatment of Kant's categorical imperative, defeating one's own end. So some, some of you might be familiar with it, others not. Let me, in a nutshell, uh, say what is going on. So in one of Kant's famous examples of something we have a duty not to do and how we discover that we have a duty not to do it because we discover that we cannot rationally will a universal practice of people taking themselves to be permitted to act in that way. He entertains the example of making a false promise and he imagines somebody who's uh, fallen into terrible debt and is absolutely desperate for money to feed their family and who conceives the idea to make a false promise to a potential lender saying that he can definitely pay back the loan even while he knows very well he will never be able to pay it back so he makes a false promise and in course guard's analysis of what sort of contradiction kant is claiming the person gets into when they imagine their reason treated as a reason that anybody might act on is that you imagine everybody taking themselves to have permission 
to make a false promise of that kind whenever they're desperate for money. So we think that's my basic maxim. What if everybody acted on that maxim? What would that practice look like? Oh dear, it's gonna be a situation where, because everybody knows that we regard ourselves as having permission to make false promises to secure loans, even when we know we can't pay them back, no one's gonna believe you when you actually try and do that. So it's not gonna work and you won't be able to achieve the very end that you have conceived the strategy to achieve. And so there's a pragmatic self-defeat of defeating your own end, which is discovered when you attempt to universalize the reason on which you would be acting. And therefore in Kant's view, you discover that you have a duty to refrain since Kant's overall view is that we must act only on reasons that would make sense as universal permissions. Um, the thing is, this is sort of relevant. This is getting us some way to thinking about the kind of pragmatic self-defeat that I want to argue is involved in demanding forgiveness, but it doesn't really tell us why. So it's true that if I've apologized to you for the stupid lie I told you, and I now, you don't seem to be forgiving me yet, and I'm getting very frustrated, and I've gone beyond pleading, and I'm now like demanding. <laughs> it's true that I now, in my, in my um, assertive demanding state, uh, will defeat my own end, because the more I demand it of you, I, I, even if you, as it were, at that point, try to give it to me by saying the words, okay, I forgive you, I will find that I can't receive the thing that I'm longing for. That's sort of true, but we still don't know why. And in particular, it's not something that's revealed through imagining it as a universal practice. It's got nothing to do with everybody else does it or not. It's got everything to do with just you and me and what's gonna go on if I try on my own, even if no one else in the world uh, is imagined to ever be acting on this permission. It wouldn't work even just you and me. And we still don't know why, but there will be a kind of defeating one's own end aspect to it. A second model of uh, pragmatic self-defeat, we might call performative refutation. And one of the places this comes up in philosophy, another kind of classic place, is in some interpretations of Rene Descartes' cogito ergo sum, and what is self-defeating or somehow uh, yeah, incoherent about doubting that I'm a thinking thing. And of course, as soon as I doubt that I'm a thinking thing, since doubting is a way of thinking, then I am kind of contradicting myself. But on the performative self-refutation interpretation of that uh, kind of incoherence, there's been an emphasis on um, uh, the, the practical activity of engaging in doubt. So here I am performing the doubt that I'm a thinking thing in performing that doubt, I perform the falsity of the idea that I might not, as a thinking thing, exist. And so here's Williams uh, putting it with, with a nice little analogy. He says, the denials of I am thinking and I exist are not logical falsehoods, but pragmatically self-defeating or self-falsifying. We might compare someone saying, I'm absent in a roll call. It's sort of comic. It's like, you know, as soon as you put your hand up and said, I am absent, you've demonstrated that you're not absent. So the performance undermines the truth of the thing you're uh, asserting. Again, there's something, something appropriate. It's getting at something about the normality of forgiveness here. Not quite, because it seems to me when I demand the forgiveness from you, now that I've apologized for this ludicrous lie I've told you as my close friend, I'm not necessarily performing, you know, falsifying the idea that you should forgive me, right? I might be, I might be, and there's an element of truth in that. In particular, if my tone gets so kind of pushy that you come to think that I'm really undermining the good work that my apology did, because in, as it were, trying to force the forgiveness out of you, I thereby demonstrate I don't really get or fully regret the wrong that I've done you. You know, obviously if I'm demanding forgiveness now, it must be that I don't get how serious that lie was that I told you. So certainly it's possible that certain forms of demanding forgiveness can uh, demonstrate exactly this kind of structure where the performance of it will undermine uh, the normativity. So I, I'll be undermining the idea that I deserve the forgiveness, but I think it needn't be like that. There's an element of it perhaps, but one needn't uh, construe it quite like that. Or if we think that is appropriate, we still don't know why. Why is it 
impossible for me to demand the gift of forgiveness? Why is it that that should be seen to, at least in some degree, undermine the good work of the apology? What, what's the more fundamental explanation? And I want to suggest that the fundamental explanation is actually very simple, that the pragmatic self-defeat that's involved in my demanding forgiveness as of right, just because I've apologized, um, is that forgiveness is a gift and it doesn't merely imitate the normativity of gifts. It, its normativity is that of a gift. And it's a fact about gifts that they are necessarily received and not taken. So just to perform it in a cartoon way in our heads, there you are with your gift for me. And I run past you and grab it. It's like, well, you haven't given me the gift. Now it's all spoiled because I've just grabbed the thing, regardless of whether you were, how, how and when and whether you were going to actually choose to give it to me. And so the act of generosity has been preempted by, by my grabbing it from your hands. And I just want to say that that is the fundamental fact about forgiveness, that it is a gift and displays that normativity, which explains the other aspects of pragmatic self-defeat, that I'm going to defeat my end because a gift isn't the sort of thing that can be grabbed. A gift is the sort of thing which must be received. Um, and if I, as it were, grab it from you, demand that you go out to the store and buy my congratulatory gift or my anniversary gift and say that I have a right to it. Even if I get it in my hands, perhaps you, you, offer, the, you offer the words, I forgive you, or I get the precious bracelet I want as my gift. Its meaning is going to deteriorate before our very eyes into some empty ersatz version of the thing, or perhaps an active message of non-love, non-commitment, non-congratulation, non-forgiveness, because now we've just got, it's all gone sour. So I think the proper treatment of what I call the electivity worry the worry that a kind of gift-like aspect at the base, even of conditional forgiveness, looks in tension with the rational requirement, isn't to start fussing about saying there isn't a rational requirement or it's not directed or it's not relational. It, it is all these things. Forgiveness is interpersonal and intimate and relational. And I do it, owe it to my good friend to forgive her for the stupid lie she told me if she's uh, apologetic in the right way and it's an entirely directed and personal thing the solution instead lies in observing the pragmatic impossibility or or incoherence of extracting forgiveness however deserved as of right and that is because forgiveness is a gift and its normativity simply displays the ordinary normativity that gifts display which is that they can have all these sorts of dyadic and directed and relational obligations, but it cannot be demanded as of right. And if you do demand it as of right and in some way succeed in taking it with your own hands, demanding that the words be said, I forgive you, you will find you end up not with the thing that you long for and deserve and are owed, but you'll end up with some pale imitation or worse, some version of the thing which actively has the opposite meaning. So in demanding to be forgiven, you can too easily end up either with nothing or with an active non-forgiveness on your hands. Thanks very much. <laughs>